Welcome back. Uh, this is the second talk uh, in this sort of advanced series. Uh, this is making the jump from batch streaming beam primitives. Uh, before we get started, this talk is going into specific beam primitives for streaming pipelines, how they're used, how you can configure different settings. Uh, if you want some explanations as to why you would want or need to use these things, you should watch the first talk in this series, making the jump from batch to streaming motivations and concepts before jumping into this content. Uh, they, if you are already familiar, feel free to stick around, but I think that talk has some very good context. So uh, this is gonna be probably the most uh, surface level thing we explain here is that reading data from streaming sources is a little different than reading data from bounded sources. Uh, if you're familiar with Beam, you may have heard the term splittable do fun before or SDFs. These are transforms that provide information to the runner about the work being done, usually with the, the two key things being how much work there is to do and how much work has already been done. Uh, these allow for splitting that work, which is why they have their name. Uh, the idea is that you can rebalance your work on the fly if things are taking too long or if you have more workers, you need to scale up, uh, things like that. Uh, SDFs are really important for IOs and more importantly, streaming IOs, because when you're reading data, you want to be able to ingest that data into your pipeline quickly. Or in the case of a streaming transform, you want something that can self checkpoint. So self checkpointing refers to the idea of an uh, IO splittable do fund to stop ingesting data and signal to the runner to resume its operation later. Uh, for streaming cases, this is, you know, an IO hasn't gotten data in a couple minutes and we're going to choose to checkpoint and have the runner sort of circle back to that do fund to check for more input later. Um, this is not something you really necessarily need to know. Uh, a lot of Beam IOs uh, are splittable do funds and support self checkpointing. Uh, the Go, Java, and Python SDKs all support self checkpointing. Uh, do funds. So this is really just an implementation detail. But in some SDKs, there are IOs that have SDF implementations and uh, more typical do fund implementations. Always opt for the SDF. That is the pro tip I'm going to give you. Always choose the SDF. Oh, <laughs> generally speaking, uh, you want to use IOs that are splittable so they can split out to multiple machines and sell checkpoints so you're not wasting computational resources waiting for data. You don't just have one machine streaming these things in. Uh, Beam provided IOs follow this pattern, as I've said. Uh, the Java implementations are typically the gold standard for IOs. Uh, they're the most mature, they're the most heavily developed, they're leaned on a lot for things like data flow templates. So uh, like I said, check for the SDF implementations. Usually they're called out. Uh, Always read your doc strings just to make sure because you don't want to have a performance bottleneck in your pipeline because you've used the wrong IO. So now we'll get into something that I touched on in the previous talk that I want to get into a little bit more, windowing. So as I said before, windowing types, we have the global window, we have interval windows, and we have session windows. So the global window, is one large single window from Unix time zero to the maximum Unix time. By default, Beam operates within this window until told otherwise. So generally speaking, if you want to operate in the global window, you get it for free. You don't have to do any extra work. But that's not the interesting case. We want to talk about if we want windowing. And so fixed interval windows are windows of a fixed length that occur at the same interval. Uh, no gaps in the windows, no overlap. How you'd use that in Java, we have a P collection of strings, and then we window into fixed windows of with a duration of 60 seconds. So this is a 60 second interval window. And then this is what interval windows look like. Uh, it's important to note that typically when you're dealing with windowing, you are also applying things per key. Um, so you can see this is a 30 second uh, window duration example. Across each key, you have window 0, 1, 2, and 3. Regular intervals, no overlap. Each key gets its own definition. Uh, this graphic is from the Beam Programming Guide, as will the rest of the window graphics be. Sliding interval windows, you have a fixed length and a fixed period, but the period is less than the length. Uh, 
And so you have a series of windows with some amount of overlap, data existing in more than one window at a time. Uh, similar setup code-wise as you would do before, you use the same window into transform, but instead of fixed windows, you have sliding windows of duration, 30 seconds, and then you set your period of five second intervals. So you, in this case, you would have a sliding window starting every five seconds, but they're 30 seconds in length. Uh, this is <laughs> the uh, complicated example of 60 second windows with a 30 second period. So you wind up with overlapping windows in this con context. You have from zero to 60 is a window, from 30 to 90 is a window, from 60 to 120 is a window and so on. And so you have these sort of bounding boxes showing where the overlaps are. So the elements that are occurring from 30 to 60 are actually in two windows at the same time. Same thing as you go down. Uh, that way you get sort of that gradual transition of your data. You can look for like smoother trends over time, et cetera. Session windowing is the weird one. And I, I talked a little bit about this in the last talk, but uh, it doesn't hurt to reiterate you're doing a dynamic windowing approach characterized by windowing events that occur with a length of time shorter than some timeout occurring uh, between them. Uh, these are functionally uh, in the background treated as merging windows. So you have a series of sliding windows that are uh, factoring in events. And then if you have two adjacent windows with events in them, you actually merge them into a single bigger window. Uh, under the hood, this is pretty complicated, but if we look at the code, it's relatively easy to apply. You once again use the window into transform, but this time you set a session windowing strategy with a gap duration. In this case, 600 seconds was the choice, with the idea being that if you have two events that occur within 600 seconds of each other or 10 minutes, uh, they would be treated as being in the same window. So if we have something here, uh, you can look at events happening in sessions. This is split out per key, and each key gets its own windowing treatment here. So key zero, for instance, you have a first window, and then the minimum gap duration is exceeded. So the next slate of events happens in window one. Similar thing, a gap, you have window two, another gap, and then window three here, you, you do have gaps in your data, but they are smaller than the minimum gap duration. So all of this data winds up in window three. You can see similar behavior for that with key one. You only have two windows produced because there's only one sufficiently large gap. Same with uh, key two, you have two sufficiently large gaps that turn into three windows. So that's a quick overview of windowing. Now we get into something a little more complicated. We get into watermark estimation. So. Watermark estimation beam is set per data source. Each one has its own strategies and methods on how to estimate the watermark. So uh, those are, you know, tuned somewhat. But remember, we're leaning on heuristics to estimate watermarks, and we can almost never be perfect. Like uh, we addressed in the last talk, there are many reasons data can be late. There are many potential issues that can arise. So we have to except that we're not going to be perfect. But uh, you can set custom watermark estimation, but generally speaking, it's better to let the beam side choose that per data source. But what you can talk about are triggers. This is a very beam specific me uh, mechanism for operating on Windows now. So what is a trigger? Triggers are a beam mechanism that declare when the output for a given window should be materialized relative to an external sig signal. Triggers can be configured to fire multiple times. You can update your output over time depending on like data coming in. And this is how Beam handles revisions to data or data that comes in late as you are setting triggers. Uh, and then when a trigger is activated, the materialized output for a given window is a pane. We do love our cute naming here. So you output a pane that it encapsulates the data that is produced by that trigger. Multiple panes can be output for a single window as processing continues, and then you have to handle those as you go. So some common trigger types, there are repeated update triggers. 
where you output the pain repeatedly for a given window either you're getting you know new records or some amount of processing time has passed before you've gotten a new record uh generally speaking using these triggers requires some balancing of latency and cost because if you're doing a very expensive transform and doing a very expensive calculation and then you're using repeated update trigger you could be doing a very expensive calculation over and over and over again so you do have to keep that in mind uh, another common type of trigger is a completeness trigger the output gets materialized when you have some threshold of completeness reached uh, usually this would be on the watermark uh, advancing past the end of the window, for instance. Uh, but this is also how you could handle late or missing data is you get something late later, your pain is now more complete, so you have to re-emit. Quick code example of this for watermark completeness in repeated update. Uh, of course, because you're dealing with triggers, you have to have things windowed. So in the watermark completeness case, you are applying a window into transform and then also applying triggering for to uh, after the watermark materialize that output. And then in the repeated update trigger case, this configuration is doing the same thing, same fixed windows, but instead of triggering after the watermark is complete, it's going to trigger every five elements. So you get five more elements and you re-emit the pane. And then Okay, so we've got the triggers, but how do we handle late data after we've emitted panes? Well, in the case of the completeness triggers, we do want, we of course want some level of handling because in theory, we've emitted the pane thinking it is complete. Now it's not. What do we do? Uh, and this is important because we don't want to repeatedly recalculate panes for old data. Uh, if we have to do this regularly, uh, part of the problem is you have implications for things like caching and garbage collection because to recalculate things with panes you are holding on to the value of things in those panes and so the longer you are accepting late data and the more you recalculate that's memory incursion cost and you're still adding the cost of recalculating pain values on top of that so beam provides an allowed lateness option so this is a concept where you determine how late you will allow data to be and still be included in your output. Uh, allowed lateness is relative to the current watermark value. Uh, we're not keeping up with processing time. It's just how far behind the watermark will we allow data to be? Uh, keeping up with processing time is hard. You're doing wall time. Don't want to deal with it. So this is a simpler abstraction. So relatively simple thing here. We have similar P collection of strings. We window it into fixed windows, and then we set an allowed lateness for data on top of that. So in this case, we're allowing data up to two days late in terms of processing time, or yeah, event time relative to the watermark, sorry. And so if data comes in, with an event time that is within two days of the current watermark, we can recalculate those panes. In a more complex code example, this is gonna look more similar to what you're, you want to do here. Uh, we have our same P collection of strings, but in this context, we actually have uh, a couple options with our triggering. So with our windowing same fixed windows of a minute but then when we trigger we set multiple values uh, after watermark means that we want to emit the pane once the watermark is passed pretty typical completeness trigger but now we have two extra configuration options that we want to pass uh, with early firings uh, we actually are saying okay if we get data before the uh, watermark is passed. We'll like emit the pane every minute. We can start doing calculations, what have you. And then you can also set with late firings, which is the case that you are getting late data. And in this case, we are configuring the pane to be emitted after getting any late data. You get one piece of late data, re-emit the pane. 
and then that same allowed lateness of two days. So for a window of two days relative to the watermark, you can get your late data in a minute. And of course, before the watermark is passed, you're just steadily updating that pane so you can do calculations on it and see the values that are being calculated within that window before the watermark is actually passed. So we have panes, we're working with panes. How do we manage them a bit better? Because when you specify a trigger, you also have to specify an accumulation mode for the window because when you're re-emitting panes, you have to decide what you want to do with them. Uh, do you want to make the pane uh, larger? Do you want to discard earlier data? What do you want to do? So accumulating triggers re-emit the data that was previously uh, emitted along with the new data. You can set uh, the accumulating fired panes option when you set the trigger. And the idea is that the pane will just grow with that new data. So if we had an accumulating trigger that fired every three elements, you see this first trigger emits 583, second trigger emits 583, and then the new elements 15, 19, and 23. And then the third trigger fires 583, 15, 19, 23, and 9, 13, and 10. So these are all uh, emitted repeatedly. So how you handle that data down the stretch may change further down the pipeline. Uh, a discarding trigger only emits the new data it received since it last fired. And this is most commonly used when the downstream transform is doing some sort of aggregation with the panes already. So if you're doing some sort of summation or uh, arithmetic calculation, this is a, a pretty useful idea. So if you're uh, setting this with the discarding fired panes, what will happen is your first trigger fires, you get the first three elements, 583. Second trigger fires, you get 15, 19, 23. You don't get the first three elements. And then the third trigger fires, you get 9, 13, and 10. You do not get any of the previous elements. So uh, something to keep in mind with that, well, I'll go back and edit this. Uh, something to keep in mind with this is that uh, if you're doing aggregations further down the stream, uh, you would want to do discarding because uh, you would, in theory, be updating the aggregations as you're going as well and receiving panes. So you don't want to receive elements that you've already considered multiple times. That's sort of the motivating example behind wanting to keep uh, discarding that data. So uh, quick uh, shout outs for extra reading. Some of this will look familiar from the previous talk. Uh, streaming systems, the what, where, when, and how of large scale data processing is a great resource for these concepts written from the perspective of Apache Beam. Uh, there are code snippets in there. It's largely written in Java, lots of great graphics, things like that. And then I also wanna shout out the Beam programming guide where I got multiple uh, graphics for this talk, and, uh, largely the windowing and some of the code snippets. Uh, it's a free online resource on the Beam website with explanations of these concepts, code snippets per language for Java, Python, Go, and some examples even have TypeScript SDK examples. Uh, this is a wonderful place to get outlines on how to do these things, why you'd want to do these things, all sorts of things like that. Wonderful resource. Uh, it's also an open source page, so if you find something wrong or you want to contribute, we do accept contributions on the Beam repo itself. Thank you so much.